Professor Leach, uh, very warm welcome to you from Epilepsy Scotland. Um, we're here to do a question and answer session about people living with epilepsy during the coronavirus pandemic. So before we start, I'd like to thank you very much for giving us your time and allowing us to put some questions to you. We looked for questions from a whole variety of uh, sources, people who have epilepsy, living with people who have epilepsy, or indeed supporting directly or indirectly people who have epilepsy. And we also made reference to some of the associated conditions such as the learning disabled. So all the questions that have come in, and there has been a vast number of questions come in, and I know we're limited for time, so we won't get through them all. Um, are very much from those people and also some from some of our fellow epilepsy organizations. So if it's all right with you, um, uh, so I should probably introduce myself actually because I don't think we've met. Um, I'm Leslie Young, the Chief Executive at Epilepsy Scotland, so hi. Hi, good to, ha good to see you and thank you for having me. You're very welcome. So given that we do have an awful lot to get through, I wonder if we should just uh, crack on and make a start. Whatever works for you. If you can see and hear me, okay, and your techie people are happy, I'm ready. I think we're good to go. So shall we just do that? Okay. Great. Okay. So um, Jason, before we start, I'm assuming that you don't mind that I call you Jason. I, I certainly do not. Only my mother calls me Professor. Oh, right. Okay, then. So uh, the first question is in the context of uh, social distancing and self-isolation. Um, as you will be aware, people who have epilepsy are very dependent on others, essentially strangers, should they have a seizure out in the community, in the public. With places starting to reopen and people with epilepsy now going out more, um, if they were to have a seizure in the community, what would be the advice you would give to those people who would want to administer some first aid, but acknowledging the two meter distancing rule? So our advice is, is not really that much different at this stage of the route map from the beginning. It's just there are more people around, including more people who live with epilepsy in their daily lives, we would expect people to use common sense to deal with emergencies in an appropriate way and to manage physical distancing if they could. But if you can't, then that's a risk-based scenario in which you would have to do something just like all other risk-based scenarios. That We've just layered another risk on top of everything else that people live with every day. So. It, it may seem a poor analogy, but if somebody has a seizure on a building site, that's probably more risky than somebody having a seizure in a shopping mall. And we already deal with those types of risk. So what we're doing now is we're adding the potential that one or other of the individuals involved there might, might have COVID. And we would expect people to be careful. We'd expect people to use hand washing afterwards. We'd expect them to be sensible and phone for help and deal with the distancing, uh, uh, but have a, have a kind of exemption for the distancing if they had to, for instance, put somebody in the recovery position or provide support or whatever. So I, I actually don't, don't think it makes that any more difficult or worse, as long as we can remove the stigma of, of having to get engaged. Indeed, I think that's very helpful. The one thing I would come back with is a supplementary question really is, it might be that just by uh, you know human nature, someone goes to help, which is great. Um, they they support that individual through their seizure seizure and a bit beyond until possibly the paramedics or somebody else arrives. Um, is there any specific advice you could offer that we as the, the uh, patient representing organization could give to those who were then concerned about their own health other than what you've already stated? No, not really. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a common sense, common sense, slightly emergency situation. So I, I would expect people, so if it were me, and I had a face covering available, I would wear a face covering. I would, I would sanitize my hands afterwards. But 
I, I would kind of have done that before anyway, maybe not the face covering, but so so I I don't think we should overthink it. I think I think we should just provide the support where we can. I mean, we, we've never at any point in the pandemic, although this is the most serious public health challenge the world has ever faced, I, I, I use those words uh, deliberately. At every stage we've said emergency and urgent care, caring, essential visits to visit relatives are, are all acceptable so that there are of course there's no risk-free route here but there are exceptions always and and you can't allow for every exception in the guidance that's that's impossible yeah. so we would expect society to step up to do what it could but to do it in a safe way well i think that's really helpful and thank you for that because it will make it easier for some people who do uh, worry about going out and who know that they may well seizure in the community and they would go out with a bit more confidence knowing that people could support them. Yep. So the second question Jason that's come in is from uh, somebody who is a family member um, and I will read that question to you. So she says my son with epilepsy has complex needs and relies on support staff to go out and about with places reopening, will he be able to re-engage with his support staff despite the two-meter social distancing rule? Yeah, yes, is the fundamental answer, but you are mixing households. So, so again, no risk-free path here. So if you mix households, there is risk. It, so be careful. So use public health measures, carry hand sanitizer in your pocket, use cough etiquette if you're in a crowded place, wear face coverings if you possibly can. But yes, we at no stage have said you, you, you have to be completely restricted in that environment. Better to have fewer support people than more support people. So it, so it may be that whether that's a subsector support, family support, local authority support, it might be better if it were considered in a kind of bubble. Uh, it's not an exact science, but better to have a connection with two other people than 10 other people because the risk is lower. So, so, but the fundamental answer is yes, you can engage with society in a, a more than you have in the last little while, but you have to bear in mind the, the guidelines that are in place for everybody else. Yes, so again, a, a supplementary question is that um, to my knowledge, most of the care providers have been trying to do exactly as you described with their team bubbles, etc. Um, equally, they've, they've had to deal with people who are in those teams, in those bubbles, going off sick themselves, um, maybe having to self-isolate. So with the best of intentions, they have been unable to keep those bubbles as tight as you would want them or as closed as you would want them. Um, however, um, some people have found themselves in the situation where uh, for a variety of reasons, they haven't had that introduction to the new freedoms that the, the rest of us have. Um, and it, it's having an impact on their, their mental health and to a degree partly because of their lack of understanding of the rules and, and why they're being implemented. So um, do you think that there is, there is scope to um, educate the, the providers more or do you think that all the information that's there for them to use is out in the public domain or the, the, the third sector domain? Well, I think more communication is better than less communication. I think the third sector organisations are crucial in that process to help educate and help us. I think the guidance exists, but the guidance being in the public domain, I'm not naive enough to think that everybody has read the 57 pieces of workplace guidance. So, so I've barely read them and I've written some of them. So, so we, we need to use every communication angle we possibly can. Families, patients, uh, resident care home people, whatever, whether it's Epilepsy Scotland or the newspapers to get to get those messages out there. The generic messages I think are out there, well, how to protect yourself, how to be careful, how to distance. But specific guidance for individual diseases and conditions and, and situations people find themselves in, I think the third sector has a crucial role to play in helping us with that communication. 
Mm -hmm. So we've certainly tried to, to do as much as we can and balance what, what's coming out or as the generic advice to something specific to Epilepsy Scotland. And as you quite rightly say, and we acknowledge there is no risk-free route through all of this. Yep. It's making the best of what we've got and balancing the needs of the individual and the needs of the family and trying to keep that as closely aligned as possible. Um, you will also know that um, people with epilepsy very often live on their own. Um, they too regularly rely on their family unit for support. What are these individuals to do if their support system has to self-isolate and cannot provide that usual degree of help? Um, how, how would you advise that, that they deal with that because they, they, would, they would be coming into another household? So that, that's not an epilepsy problem, that's a society problem. So, so we, we want as much as possible to keep households apart so the virus can't jump across chains of transmission. It's very straightforward. If you require care, whatever that might be, whether you have dementia, whether you're a 10 year old with severe autism and you need somebody to care for you, whatever care that is, that has always been allowed. We just want to do it in a way that is as safe as possible. So if your normal care network breaks down for some reason, self-isolation or flu or, or whatever they have, then you, you should have a contingency plan in place that allows you to do it. You should always have that in place because it, it, somebody could break their leg or somebody could get COVID. We've just added another layer. If, if you can't do that with family and friends, then your local authority would then have to have a responsibility to help you. And there are hotline numbers uh, available for what that local authority support would be. But you should, you should try and do a contingency plan with family and friends if you possibly can. And the household uh, stuff, the household guidelines have got a little bit looser just this week. So you can now have people in your house you're still meant to physically distance, so you can have up to four households in your homes, including yours, so three others, and up to eight people. So the household eh, eh, regulations have, have expanded a little bit, giving more scope. You don't have to stay outside. But again, that's all risk. You've got to clean the surfaces. You've got to get everybody to wash their hands. You've got to do all those other things. So hopefully that would help with contingency plans for family and friends. Great. So we had we had another individual, a very similar situation, who uh, th this this gentleman has nighttime seizures. He he is incontinent with his seizures, and again, his family is his support uh, network. Really, and um, he hasn't been asking them to do what he would normally do, and that is come and support him in the forty eight hours after seizure, which you know that's his his time of recovery, because they'd be breaching the locks. So just, just for clarity, um, the, the basic message that you're giving, I think, is that um, if all else fails, if your normal support network cannot provide you with what you require, <laughs> it is acceptable to introduce others who can help you do that. Um, and that could be another household, it could be professional care through social services, or it could indeed be through a third sector organization. Is, is that right? Is that accurate? It is. He, he wouldn't have been breaking the lockdown guidelines if he had let uh, a carer, a helper, a family supporter in from the beginning of lockdown. We've always said that essential care visits of, yes. is one of the reasons why you can leave home, just like it is to go and get your bread and milk. So, so we want that to be balanced, of course. You, you can't just have somebody around to watch the latest movie, but, but you can have people around to look after you, or you can go and look after people. So my sister has gone and provided care and support to my parents. That, that has been essential visit. That has always been allowed. What we've added now is a more society type, friendly type visit. So now you can have people around for, for tea and cakes, as long as you're careful you don't share the tea or share the cakes. So, so the care mm -hmm. visit has always been allowed. That hasn't changed. So that gentleman mm -hmm. can have people around to help him both ju during, during that challenging period and after that challenge. Yeah. 
So there seems to be a thread then from the last conversation to this is that the guidelines have always been there and it is up to, to people to understand or help others to understand them better. Um, and it, uh, really it's all about communication and the clarity of the communication. So when we have um, people who would phone into our helpline with things that we've discussed, then we've got a much clearer idea of what we can say to them and what we can advise. And it's trying to get them to be confident to do of that. Of course. And we've scared yeah. the country half to death for good reason, because 4,000 yeah. people have died of this disease. So, so we, have to be, yeah. we have to be very, very careful with how we, how we come out of lockdown. So I, I'm not surprised people are nervous and cautious about how, how they get how they get out of this. But so we need to, we need to be very, very careful. Yeah. And I think I think you know everybody would accept that we need to err on the side of caution and for, for, for good reason. So um this this is a very short question. It may not be a short answer. Um, do you see shielding rules being kept in place until there is a vaccine for COVID-19 or what is your vision of what might happen? I do not. Uh, we've announced a shielding route map which looks slightly different from the everybody else route map, if you'll forgive the expression, and that shielding route map says that all being well, and we announced some new things today, uh, this is Thursday, so we announced some changes for tomorrow, Friday the 17th, and we that route map has two more stages, the 24th, which is next Friday, and then we hope to pause shielding on the 31st, so that on the 1st of August, shielding will be paused. We're saying paused because mm -hmm. we're scared of a winter uh, peak, a yeah. second wave, where we may have to reintroduce shielding for some groups, and we will look at that being slightly more targeted, perhaps, so it may be a little bit more individualized like it has become for children, for example, in the last few weeks. But no, I don't anticipate shielding being required until we have a vaccine. And I'm very hopeful that on the 31st, we can pause it. That's great. That will be such good news for so many people. Um, so um, probably I, I'm going to come back to that later, uh, Jason, in, in the context of a different question, if I may. So looking at the provision of services uh, just now, uh, someone has asked, uh, will face-to-face -face clinic appointments be available soon? Who will decide if I, the individual, can see my clinician or my nurse in the clinic? And what is the strategy for dealing with the backlog of clinic appointments, which inevitably will have built up during the crisis? Yeah, good questions. So the, the clinic appointments are returning now. So some people, depending on specialty and location, are going back. My, my father, again, had his ophthalmology uh, urgent appointment reinstated, and he was there last week. And all was very safe, a COVID-free pathway with distancing, with face coverings with a uh, receptionist behind Perspex, everything you would expect, and uh, all, went, all went very well. So some outpatient clinics are back. Elective surgery is gonna take a little bit longer than that, but is, is on its way back. There's remobilization plans for each health board in Scotland, and within each health board, they then have plans for each specialty. So that will come back. It won't all come back on one Tuesday night. It will have to be gradual, and it will depend on location, there will be more video conferencing than before. Some people will have to go to slightly different locations than they've been to before. But we're very hopeful that that will start to ramp up in a very serious way over the next few weeks and months. Who decides will be a combination of the care team and the individual, of course. And I would hope that would be a conversation. But you may have to do a video conferencing call before you then go for a face-to-face -face call, particularly if you don't require to be touched during your appointment, if that makes sense. And, and mm -hmm. that makes perfect sense because it's less, it's less risk. We can do more people. It allows us to, to get through them. And your, your questioner is correct. There will, of course, be a backlog. So that requires patience. It requires patience on the part of everybody in the equation to get us through that backlog as fast as we can. A lot of the health service is exhausted. They, they, have, they have worked really hard not everybody because some bits have been quieter but we've reallocated the quiet people to the busy bit so it has been an extraordinary time for health and social care 
So you're going to have to be patient with us. So people will need a bit of time off. Some people will have to go see their own families and care for their own shielded relatives. So we're not, we're not immune to this disease and its effects. But I, I'm confident that I'll get back. It's just going to take a little while. So we're going to be using a lot more technology, there's absolutely no doubt, and I suspect that's going to be the way of it for the foreseeable future. And many of us have, have um, upgraded our IT skills um, at a pace, myself included. What about, though, in the context of the clinic visits um, and uh, people needing to speak to their clinician or their nurse, for those who um, are, are of the learning disabled population, who don't understand IT or indeed do not have access to IT, what's going to happen around, around that group of people? So there's no suggestion we're replacing the health service with avatars. What we're doing is we're adding in a digital solution to help with some of the health service. I mean, that, that's always been true. We're just adding more to it. So if it's appropriate for you, if you're the I heard the story of, of, uh, of the postman in Galsby getting his gastroenterology review and reports done online. Perfect. Didn't have to interrupt his postal round. The community service maintained, took 15 minutes off, sat in his van, did his, did his consultation. I mean, there isn't, there isn't any reason for him to travel to Inverness to get a 15-minute outpatient appointment. There are, of course, if you need a mammogram, you can't do that online. So the mammogram will have to travel. Wherever that is, and there will always be those those versions, and then there'll be groups in the middle who, perhaps with a little bit of support, perhaps in their local clinic near where they live, they could do video conferencing to the big outpatient clinic at Edinburgh Royal or at the Golden Jubilee. So, and then and we will have ways perhaps of supporting people in care homes to to for somebody else to work the technology but then to have a conversation with somebody who's looking after them for their hematology or, or, or whatever that might be. So I think we'll be in a much more yeah. hybrid world of, of digital, physical phone calls. And that, that's exactly as it should be. But we're not taking away physical appointments. They will still be required. But we just have to, we just have to use them where it's appropriate to use them. Which makes perfectly good sense. Um, it's efficient for everybody if you can do it, so we do understand that. Another question from a mother um, who says, my son lives in shared supported living accommodation in the community where none of his household are shielding. When would you recommend that we can be close to him again? Should we have a test done, although, although they're asymptomatic? before they are able to give him a hug. It's almost four months since they've been uh, physically close to their son and they feel that's affecting his emotional well-being. It's really hard. That's a really tough one. So no, no to the test. There, there presently isn't any reason for uh, testing in that scenario. So the same rules apply there as apply in other households, if that's in shared accommodation. So the households can mix according to the guidelines outdoors. You can now go indoors, but you have to stay physically distanced for safety of both sides of that household. If somebody lives alone or is a single parent of children, they can form a household bubble with another household. But that doesn't sound like that scenario. That sounds like two households with multiple occupants. And therefore, I'm afraid yeah. for now, they have to stay physically distanced. And I know how tricky that is to hear. We've just brought back the fact, we've just started that 11 and under can now not physically distance. So we need to gradually move out of lockdown. So we, we literally cannot do everything at once because we're scared of the virus. So, so we have to do it gradually. And just now we've decided to use that headroom for the under 12s and some other elements of opening up care home visits are, are going to get more elaborate and some indoor household mixing which will allow those that scenario there I think to have indoor visiting and indoor household engagement but not without physical distance. Right and when do you envisage that relaxing do you have any idea at all? None that's 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 an impossible question to answer. The, the, full, the full recovery of physical distancing will require probably vaccines, but it okay. may be that we can, we can decide to create household bubbles in the future or 
we can gather certain groups together or there will be exceptions. But for society to completely go back to normal, we'd need to globally eradicate the virus, which doesn't seem very likely since last Friday was the biggest number of positives we've ever had. 260,000 people caught this virus last Friday, globally. And, or we need a vaccine. And the vaccine science is encouraging, but, but not there yet. So just to stay with this topic a little bit, and, uh, is that people who generally live in houses of multiple occupancy tend to have more than one condition. So it may be epilepsy, it may be epilepsy and learning disability uh, and, and physical disabilities as well. And um, I understand the principle of, uh, of the, 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 what you've been describing. Um, so if you have one house of multiple occupancy and another, then you're, you're, you are literally multiplying the risks. I understand all that. Um, if we look at the general well-being of those individuals, particularly um, the fact that they, they may have limited understanding of why they cannot see their mums, their dads, whoever, and their mental health um, is being hugely impacted. Uh, is, there, is there any possibility of a contingency for that within what you've been describing? I'm assuming the answer is no, but I feel I'm obliged to ask. No, the answer is not no. So we've always said that you can, you can visit, for, uh, it's not the right verb, but you can visit if, distress and anxiety, mental health, dementia, whatever it might be, would be worse if that named individual couldn't, couldn't visit, either in a care home or a long-term long -term residential environment or whatever. There is a gray area in the middle there, of course, between a semi-detached house with a family of four in it and a care home with 300 in it. There are a variety of versions in between there, and one of them is supported living for adults with learning disabilities, with epilepsy, with, with other conditions where the, the care element may be quite limited and actually people manage it in the main by themselves with occasional visits and so, so you have to use your common sense we're, we're not we're not doing this because we're bad we're doing this because we don't want people to catch the virus so mm -hmm. if, if you can if you believe that that visit is completely essential for the person's well-being then yes you can visit but you have to balance that with the risk of you taking in the virus. Mm -hmm. so, but, but if you're willing to take that risk and minimize it as much as you can with mitigation and the visit is essential, then that's never been, that's never been off the table. That's always been allowed. You, but I'd say again, you can't go and just sit on the sofa and watch the tail. That is not allowed. No. It is now no. in the mixing the household's physically distanced thing. But that's different from an essential visit for somebody's health and well-being. You've always been able yes. to visit for essential health and well-being. Okay. I think that's really helpful to clarify because, again, it's about communication, Jason, and um, there are mixed messages, not from yourselves, but th there's a message coming out from, from yourselves. There's a message coming out from individual providers um, who I suspect are being guided by, by others possibly the SSSC and, and other organizations like that. So th there is a disparity in some of the communication and also the interpretation of some of the things that are coming out. So to have all that as clear as you have stated is incredibly helpful. I think it's interpretation. So pe people are cautious and, and they're absolutely right to be cautious. Imagine a scenario in which you had a multiple occupancy, six people with learning disabilities, two with epilepsy, and a family visit, and there's a positive case generated in that house. That would be, that would be unthinkable. So, so that's why people are right to be cautious. However, I completely understand there's loneliness, there's distress, there's risk of falls, there's risk of nutritional challenges, there's all kinds of risks in, in, that, in that home without family visits. So we have to balance those risks somehow. And some of it is not black and white. Some of it, unfortunately, the government can't tell you what's right or wrong. I know that comes as a great shock to everybody. Some of it has to be about you, you, you using your common sense about what is the best way of managing that really difficult challenge. 
And I have to do that with my family and my personal circumstances, and so do you, and so does everybody else. Yeah, so. that's great. Thanks. So, um, probably a much simpler question to answer. Obviously, during a seizure, some people with epilepsy are incontinent, or they have this great urge to, to go to the toilet just after seizure. Um, all the public facilities are closed just now. Is there anything that you can help us with about uh, any idea of when these are likely to open again? So we've never closed them. It's been a local authority choice or a private provider choice. So, and about safety, public bathrooms are a bit of a, uh, an attraction for the virus. So they're often mm. poorly ventilated. They're often not as clean as your home. They uh, are warm often, they're well heated. So they're everything the virus loves. So it's completely understandable that Loch Lomond and the Trossachs didn't, didn't like keeping its public convenience is open. There has now been public health guidance about what you should do, how often you should clean them. And as society opens and people move more, more and more are opening up. So I think you'll see over the next little while, shopping malls, national parks, other places, garages and others will start to open them up with, with additional help for uh, cleaning and provision of what that might have to look like in the future. So I, I'm hopeful that I'll start to, you'll start to see a difference in the next few weeks. That's great. That's really helpful. Um, we've touched upon learning disability in, in our conversation so far. So obviously epilepsy and learning disability can go hand in hand to a greater or lesser extent. Um, does the current provision of routine repeat testing for COVID-19 extend to care homes for people with learning disabilities? What about the staff working in those situations um, and other residential social care settings? So yes is the basic answer to the, to the first bit of the question. So residential care homes, whoever the residents are, yes, weekly testing for staff and testing for staff and patients if there's a positive case, or residents and staff if there's a positive case. There is a grey area we've already touched on where a, a supported accommodation or a residential accommodation where you're really just looking after each other or family, look, where, where we wouldn't have the same responsibility, where there isn't full-time staff and there isn't full-time care. But a, care homes for the elderly no different from care homes or residential homes for any other category of uh, individual. Um, so I'm, go I'm going to ask a supplementary uh, or pick up a point here because um, we have been led to believe that it depends on the registration of the residential setting. So for example, if the registration is about looking after elderly people, uh, then the testing goes ahead as described for both staff and, and uh, tenants. Um, where that registration is for people with a learning disability, uh, that, that, that hasn't been the case. Now, one could argue too that um, some people with learning, learning disabilities will be in that regist registration, but they could be elderly, so they may well be missing out. So um, is it your view that this is yet another um, misinterpretation of the guidelines? You're, you're at a level I couldn't promise to be right or wrong. My, my, <laughs> my, and we should, go to, we should go check, which is always what you should do when I answer a question. So we should, we should just make sure, my understanding, is that the weekly testing for carers, for staff, applies in both of those sectors. There will be some exceptions to that where there's, where there's like a caretaker rather than full-time social carers. But, but mm -hmm. in, in settings where people are resident and there is social care provided, my understanding is that weekly testing of those workers is in place. It's not perfect yet because it's quite a lot of people and we have to ramp up the systems. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised if it hasn't all happened, but it is coming. Residents don't get tested until there's a positive case. So, so that's what I would expect, but we should probably just check the guidance and the answers with, with, the, with the policy department in the government just to make sure I'm not uh, getting it wrong. 
wouldn't be the first time. Right. Well, um, I, I, I'm guilty of getting things wrong too, so so that's fine. Um, I think we should check that because it is something that's come up in conversation and in discussion with different providers, etc. So I think it is something that we should probably look at. Um, this brings us on to a completely different service provision, um, and it's that of neurophysiology. Uh, so it has been a key support for those in intensive care throughout the pandemic. Um, they're also critical, the, the neurophysiologists, in, in helping to diagnose people who have epilepsy or may have epilepsy. Um, it, is, it is a service that is reaching or nearly at crisis point. Um, many consultants are due to retire over the next five years. So what, what is the Scottish Government's plan to support that key vital service? Yeah, so this is a pre-COVID problem and a present problem. This is mm -hmm. something we are, we are very conscious of. It, it's a struggling specialty for recruitment. It's a very, very difficult uh, occupational path. You have to you spend a lot of time to get there. Uh, it's in the Neurological Action Plan, so the Neurological Action Plan, which was uh, launched pre-COVID, of course, has been paused at some level because we paused everything else, because the civil service is off doing COVID, uh, along with the rest of the world. But we will get back to that, and I think in the medium term, that, that will absolutely need resolved. But I don't have a solution today for it, but it is still very much on the radar. On the radar. That, that's good. Um, we, we have a lot of, we do a lot of work that with the neurophysiologists very obviously, so they're very keen to know what's happening there. Um, and about the third sector, obviously very close to my heart, our hearts, um, the Scottish Government uh, stepped in to support some of the charities in the financial crisis because of the lockdown, which was gratefully received. Others have been using uh, their reserves to, to keep them afloat. When the reserves run out, will the same help that has already been afforded be afforded to those who have used up their reserves so that they can continue to work alongside our health healthcare providers, uh, professional colleagues, um, to support those who have epilepsy because you know we're a social care health partnership so one would hope that that would be the case so that's a little above my pay grade i think i think that's the first one you've <laughs> asked that that goes to the politics and the decision making rather than the advisor I, I know that the scottish government has provided support both for the business sector the charity sector the arts and theater sector and, and that is welcome it is never enough of course it, it is it is impossible for it to be enough and there will have to be, uh, as we come through this, more support as, as we keep going for, for each of these sectors, whether you're oil and gas or your chest, heart and stroke Scotland or your cancer care or epilepsy care. So particularly because fundraising has been really difficult for many, we haven't been running long marathons or jumping from high buildings to raise money. And, but organisations have found innovative ways of doing that and new ways of trying to raise that money. And the government will have to take a position, of course, about what that means. But I, I think the, the, the fundamental answer to your question is political or prioritization rather than the clinical advice. Yeah, uh, you know, I accept that. Um, I think that, you know, it, looking at it objectively and using our own organisation as, as a good example, we would estimate that our annual income uh, is going to be down by about 62%, which is, yeah. which is a huge dent in income. And you marry that with the inability, simply because of what's happening, to run the marathons, all the big fundraisers that we used to have. Now, I, I have to give credit to, to my own team. They have, they've been quick, they've been flexible, creative, all the things. And it's not unique to Epilepsy Scotland but there will still be a considerable loss. And then, of course, the other ingredient is that 
um, there are going to be more people who require the support of the organisation. And again, not unique to Epilepsy Scotland. So one would hope that at least those discussions would be held earlier rather than later before that too gets to crisis point. But I do, I, I, I accept, I accept your assertion that it's a, it's a, a political question more than a, an advisor's question. Um, all in all, I think that um, the, the organization um, and our professional colleagues and our other epilepsy organizations have done a sterling job at um, helping with the sharing of information, giving some um, signposting for people who have this, many of the difficulties that we've, we've discussed today. And I applaud them for that. Um, I would thank you too for the updates that you give, the clarity with which you give them because they're most helpful. And of course, for your time and your clarity today. So I thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you, Jason, um, and never want to be backward at coming forward. I hope we can do so again later in the year and um, have a catch up and look at what progress has been made and where we, we need to fill some of the information gaps or look at how uh, else we need to be doing things. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd like to thank you very much and um, I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much for having me. And I, I would... Uh, it also agree that subsector organizations including yours have stepped up into a hugely difficult environment like everybody has and everybody's had to change that hasn't been normal for a number of months so I'm, I'm very grateful to to be able to thank you your members your organization those your partners to, and for, for your help in the health and social care system so thank you very much much appreciated thank you and we'll speak soon